karena janji jalan selalu rata tetapi dia berjanji berikan kekuatan jangan pernah menyerah jangan berputus asa mujizat Tuhan ada Jangan berputus asa, mujizat Tuhan ada bagi yang setia dan percaya. Jangan pernah Baik Bapak Ibu, Saudara-saudari, uh, itu tadi video slide dari PCC Medan dan uh, sekarang ini PCC Medan sedang uh, bertumbuh dan sudah uh, bertambah menjadi tiga gereja. Uh, dari gereja PCC Brian, ada PCC Tanjung Mulia dan tahun 2018, Agustus 2018 kita membuka satu lagi gereja baru yaitu PCC Helpetia yang digembalakan oleh Pastor Jackson dan uh, kami juga tahun 2018 telah membuka ibadah-ibadah uh, baik itu ibadah sesi pertama pagi untuk pemuda-pemudi ibadah sesi kedua untuk umum dan ibadah sesi ketiga untuk umum juga dan puji Tuhan Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari gereja PCC Medan uh, sekarang ada tiga di Medan dan di Brian itu ada sekitar lebih kurang 550 lebih jemaat yang kita layani Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari dan di PCC Tanjung Mulia ada sekitar 70-80 orang jemaat yang dilayani dan di Helpetia ada sekitar 20-25 orang yang kita layani dan kami mengucapkan terima kasih banyak kepada uh, gereja EOJ Kajang Malaysia yang telah mensupport kami mulai dari tahun 2007 sampai sekarang kami bersyukur sebab uh, Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari telah menjadi berkat bagi kami di ladang misi di PCC Medan dan apa yang Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari berikan kepada kami itu kami pergunakan dengan sebaik-baiknya untuk membuka gereja-gereja baru di kota Medan dan kami berterima kasih, terima kasih buat dukungan Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari terima kasih buat pemberian Bapak Ibu Saudara-saudari yang telah memberkati kami di ladang misi khususnya di Medan doa kami Tuhan Yesus terus memberkati gereja EOJ Kajang memberkati para pastor 
para leader dan juga seluruh jemaat Tuhan yang ada di sini yang terus mensupport kami di Medan. Kami percaya gereja ini akan semakin luar biasa dipakai Tuhan untuk memberkati bangsa-bangsa baik itu di luar negara maupun di dalam negeri ini. Terima kasih Tuhan Yesus memberkati kita semua. Shalom. Thank you so much <coughs> to Pastor Salomo. Praise God, glory to God for all his work in Medan. Why don't you give the Lord another clap of offering? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. Last but not least, we are so pleased to have our pastor here. Uh, even though he's from, he's now in Hong Kong. Actually, he's a Malaysian, I heard. Right, Pastor? Can you still remember? Bahasa Malaysia. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, Reverend Dr. Edmund Tio is a senior pastor of International Christian Assembly. He has served in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Malaysia, and Singapore before going to Hong Kong. He is the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Hong Kong. He also sits on the board of Global University, a fully accredited Accredited Christian University and Network 211 Global Vision Board. Widely recognized as a Bible teacher with a strategic leadership, strong apostolic anointing and a pastoral heart. He is also a mentor to pastors and leaders in ICA Church and believes in raising up homegrown leaders. His visionary and servant leadership have been Pivotal in bringing ICA to new levels of influence, strength, and growth. God has placed in his heart a mandate to respond to the challenge of the global work world by equipping the church to be more global in ministry and mindset. He called ICA a, go a global church <clears throat> that acts locally but impacts globally. He's married to Yvonne and they have two wonderful children, Caris and Keller. We just welcome Reverend Dr. Amantil. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, puji Tuhan ya, pada malam ini kita ingin berbicara. Kan saya heran ya, tadi Bapak ngomongnya bahasa Indonesia, langsung semuanya pintar-pintar ya. Kalau bahasa Indonesia, kan lang... kotbanya Indonesia aja loh. Iya, kalau bahasa Inggris mungkin nggak ngerti ya. Langsung kita bahasa Indonesia ya pada hari ini ya. Bisa ya, Pak? Bisa. Puji Tuhan, Haleluya. Ada Haleluya ya di sini, Haleluya. You know, it's a joy to be here today. I am grateful to your pastor, Pastor Calvin and his wife. Uh, for the invitation. If you love your pastor and his wife, would you give them a big hand too? <laughs> now, we don't have a lot of time because uh, your pastor said that uh, you guys are, I think uh, you live in this area. So what, you want to end the service at 10.30? 10.30 is fine? 10 o'clock. Let's shoot for 10 o'clock. You know, uh, when your pastor said 10.30, I was a little nervous. Because uh, in Hong Kong, uh, at least in my church, we don't end service that late. Uh, people do travel a little bit. So uh, I, I want you to know that uh, this is your mission Sunday. And um, you know, the Lord is going to move your heart. Uh, he's going to challenge you to give. The Lord will challenge you to go. Uh, the Lord will challenge you uh, to pray uh, for missions. Amen? Uh, but uh, this evening, I want to share with, some, with you something very personal in the area of missions. That each one of us, we are to be a missionary. Touch your neighbor and say, you are a missionary. Maybe you don't speak Indonesian, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, uh, I was born in Sabah and um, been in Hong Kong for the last 22 years. My wife is from Brunei. Uh, both our children, they were born in, sub, uh, in Hong Kong as well. So, um, you know, you, you have been uh, getting a lot of news from Hong Kong, uh, about Hong Kong the last six weeks or seven. Thank you for praying for Hong Kong. 
I'm not trying to run away from Hong Kong. <laughs> when I was heading to the airport, because uh, tomorrow and this weekend, I think it's going to be very crucial. I felt a little bit bad to be away from Hong Kong. It's like, you know, I should be there, the pastor should be there with the people. But uh, we'll be in prayer, and it's going to be exciting. The Lord is, will unfold His plan uh, for the city. How many of you have you been to Hong Kong? Can I see your hand? Wow. You're a missionary to Hong Kong now. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, tonight, the title of our message is Send People. Send People. There is another title, To Be Heaven Sent. There was a story told about a patient visiting his doctor after a medical uh, test. And uh, the doctor said to him, I have uh, two news for you, a bad news and a very bad news. Which one would you want first? And he told his doctor, give me the uh, very bad news. The uh, doctor said, the lab result came back to us and uh, you have only 24 hours uh, to live. So he thought to himself, so what is the other bad news? Doctor said, you know what? We've been trying to tell you since yesterday. <laughs> you know, in this world, uh, you know, there are only two types of news, the bad news and the very bad news. Every day when you flip open your newspaper or when you flip open your phone, you try to check out the news, whether it is in Hong Kong or Malaysia or wherever you are, it seems to be the headlines are all filled with bad news and the news are getting worse around the world. There are no good news at all. But you know what? This world is looking for good news. Maybe some of you here sit this evening you already have a very bad news. Maybe it is related to your health, or it may be related to your family or your wealth. And uh, you are just hoping that there will be a good news from this speaker uh, this evening. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when he came to this world, Jesus is the only one that can deliver the good news. Only Jesus. In fact, uh, Kajang, uh, KL, Malaysia, is looking for the good news. I bet that your friends and your family, the people that you know, they are waiting for a good news. And tonight, I want to challenge you that not only you go to them with a good news, but I want to challenge you at the end of this message is that you be the good news. Touch your neighbor and say, you be the good news. Uh, turn with me uh, to one passage only for this evening of Scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 40. Luke 4, verse 40 to verse 43 from the ESV Bible. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick and various diseases brought them to Jesus. And Jesus laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. In verse 41, And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. In verse 42, And when it was day, Jesus departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought Jesus and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was, say with me, sent. Come on, say with me, sent. For I was sent for this purpose. If I may pause for a moment before we relook at this text. Let me ask you a question. What was Jesus' life's ambition? What was Jesus' life's goal? What was his life's purpose? The answer is found in this text. His life goal is only one. There is only one. And that is to preach the good news. The Bible tells us that Jesus, his goal in life, it was a short life, but it was an impactful life. <laughs> 
It, you know, it's never about the length of our life, but it's always about the depth of our lives. And Jesus lived a short life, but Jesus lived his life fully and beautifully because he knew the purpose of his life. Well, it is never the season of our life, but the reason of our lives. Sometimes we confuse the season for our reason. The season is not our reason. You see, out here you have your MRT station, right? You call it MRT. That is a station, but that is not a destination. <laughs> That is a station to take you to where you want to go. You see, each one of us, we go through different seasons in life. It doesn't matter where you are right now or what season you have missed. But what is most important is that your seasons take you to the reason. The thing is that when we think our season is the reason for our living, then therefore our season become our prison. I'm supposed to get married I'm not yet married, Pastor, so and I'm pretty disappointed with God and with myself. We were supposed to have children, and, but we're still waiting. We're still waiting. So the season becomes your prison. You see, Jesus is very clear with his life reason. You see, all of us, we may have different uh, 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 vocation in life, but every one of us, we have the same calling in life. Every one of us. And that calling is found in this passage. The calling is Jesus' purpose, and that is to preach the gospel. Tell your neighbor you are God sent to preach the gospel. In this story, it tells us that Jesus preached the gospel and is accompanied with miracles, signs, and wonders. The sick got healed. Those who were demon-possessed, they were, they were delivered. In fact, even the dead came back to life. Jesus came to their small little town and they were so pleased and every one of them wanted Jesus to stay longer and to stay on. They wanted to keep Jesus to themselves and for themselves. <laughs> but Jesus is meant to be shared with all the towns and villages. Mind you, Jesus had a global ministry even at that time, 2,000 years ago, because the scriptures say that Jesus went to all the towns and all the villages. All, my friend. Have you been to all the towns and all the villages in Malaysia? I have not yet. <laughs> Maybe in Sabah. We were doing church planting in Sabah for many years. Every place we went, every day we would go to do church plant. But Jesus was radical. Every town and every every religious. I challenge you here at Kajang Assemblies of God that your goal, your goal and your purpose is to take the gospel to every towns and every villages and every city in Malaysia and beyond. Amen? Come on, give a lot a big hand. But the thing is, is the human tendency is to keep the good thing to ourselves. To keep the good thing to ourselves. I remember when I first met my wife, Yvonne, 30 years ago, Yes, 30 years ago, when I first met her, I fell in love with her the very first time I saw her. And we started courting, we started dating. And then I found out that her sisters, her family, wanted to send her to New Zealand to study. Because when I first met her, she was still in school uniform. Don't try to guess her age, all right? She was still in school uniform. I wanted to keep her to myself. I wanted to get married very quickly. And I managed to stop her sister from sending her abroad <laughs> before she changed her mind. <laughs> and there were no regrets. She did not regret not going for further studies. You see, this church, your call, each one of us, is to share Jesus, the gospel, to all the people outside the four walls of this building. You see, many try to keep Jesus inside the church. Many of us try to keep Jesus inside our home, inside our lives. It is meant it is supposed to be private. Religion is private, they said. <laughs> but you see, for Jesus, religion is public. <laughs> it is meant to be shared. It is not meant to be kept to yourself. Sometimes we try to keep Jesus only for Sunday experience or a Friday night experience like this. But Jesus is for all people and in all places. Amen? Healing people is a wonderful thing. 
But did you notice in this passage, Jesus did not say, my life purpose is to heal people. No. Raising the dead, obviously, is a powerful thing. But Jesus' life purpose is not to raise the dead. In fact, his life purpose is not even to preach about healing. But his life purpose is to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, the reign of God. And healing, deliverance, and the raising of the dead confirms the message of Jesus. In fact, the message of Jesus authenticates his miracles. It was supposed to be that way. Whenever we preach the gospel, the miracles will follow. Healing, signs and wonders will come. We don't need to even preach the gospel because we don't even need to preach about healing. What they need to hear is the gospel and not the healing. The healing will follow the gospel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes the lives of people. Did you hear Paul in Romans chapter 1 said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel who transformed lives radically. Well, Pastor Ed, what is the gospel? You said that Jesus preached the gospel. He proclaimed the gospel. And that's the only thing he did. Not another thing that he did. Not the number one thing that he did. But it's the only thing that he did. You didn't hear what I just said. Preaching the gospel is not another thing that Jesus did. It wasn't even the number one thing that he did. But it was the only thing that he did. There was no other thing. It takes precedence. It takes supremacy in everything that he does. Only the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, and nothing else, and nothing more. Then, Pastor Ed, what is the gospel? Can you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17? That is from the ESV Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 to verse 18 and then verse 30, 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Not will be a new creation, but he is a new creation, present tense. The old has passed, not will pass, but has passed. The moment you are in Christ, you become new and the old you, the old thing, is past. It's gone permanently. Behold, the new has come. In verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 21, for our sake, he make him, God make Christ, to be sin. Can you look at that verse again? To be sin who knew no sin. And obviously, who had no sin, but he became sin for our sake. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. What is the gospel? Now listen carefully. I'm going to make it so simple because it's late at night, at least for me. <laughs> listen carefully. Let me simplify it and then we'll come back to this text. The gospel is that Jesus came from heaven to earth. Jesus came from heaven to to us so that we can come to the Heavenly Father. Is it easy to remember? The gospel is, number one, Jesus came from heaven to earth so that we who are here on earth can come to the Heavenly Father. Phase number two, the gospel is Jesus, who is fully God, became fully man so that we who are fully man can become like Him. Is it alright? Number three, the gospel is Jesus 
overcame sin and death so that you and I, we can overcome sin and death. Can you say with me the word overcome? All right. So Jesus came from heaven to earth so that we who are here on earth can come to the heavenly Father. Jesus who is fully God became fully man so that we who are fully man can become like Him. Jesus overcame sin and death so that you and I, we can overcome sin and death. I'm going to explain this a little bit, but let me finish off phase number four. Jesus will come again. All right? Now, in this text, he tells us that Jesus, who is no sin, became sin for us. Now, we usually think, now we talk about preaching the gospel. I'm explaining to you what the gospel is so that you know what you're preaching. Is it okay? Fine? All right. Just in case you thought this is missions, missions Weekend, what is he teaching us? Bible doctrine. No, no, no. Now, <clears throat> so, we, we used to think that salvation is the forgiveness of sin. That is only half correct. Because if you are in the legal profession in this room right now, you quickly understand that you cannot punish an innocent man even if he volunteered to be punished. Any, any lawyers in the house? Okay, then you just have to trust me then. <laughs> my, my two kids study laws. Okay, so you have to trust me. <laughs> you cannot punish an innocent person even if he is willing to be punished. So Jesus did not come and take our punishment because He is willing. Obviously, He is more than willing, but it was not because He is willing. He took our punishment because He took our place. He became you so that you can become Him. Jesus took my place and therefore He qualified to take my punishment. So when he took my place, I took his place and therefore I become the new creation. I become the righteousness of God and Jesus became the sinfulness of man. There was a divine exchange and we sang the song. We sang the song, we actually believe it. But we have never professed it in this way. Jesus became me so that I can become him. So when Jesus went to the cross and the Father saw that man who is on the cross, you see, he looked like Edmund, the Sabahan guy. And the Father turned away. And today, the Father looks at me and he says, Hey, he looked like my son, my beloved son. Jesus Christ. So it is not, the good news is not just the forgiveness of sin, but the good news, the great news is we are given power over sin. What is so good about being forgiven? When you go home tonight, you are still under the bondage of sin. There is no good news at all. It's only good for two hours in church. When you make your confession, the moment you go back to your home, the moment you go back to your workplace, you go back to sin because you're never set free from the sin. What is so good about the gospel? If it is only promising you forgiveness. So friends, my brothers and sisters, therefore Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, that is the power to overcome sin. Do you know, if you are in Christ today, you have already overcome sin? Just in case your neighbor doesn't know, or just found out, can you turn to your neighbor, help me preach this message, tell your neighbor, you have overcome sin.
We are not sinner because we sin. I know you're getting nervous here. Listen carefully. We are not a sinner because we sin. You have to listen to me. Don't go home now. I'm going to go slow, okay? This will change your life. If you are a sinner because you sin, tell me, when was the first time you sinned? Can you remember? And what did you do? Maybe you need to go home and ask your parents. You see, none of us remember. On the contrary, because we are sinner, therefore we sin. You want me to speak in Indonesia so that you understand what I'm saying? Kita bisa bahasa Indonesia loh ya. Mungkin itu lebih jelas ya. Kalau bahasa Inggris itu kurang tepat ya mungkin. We're not a sinner because we sin. On the contrary, because we're a sinner, therefore we sin. Religion deals with the act of sin. But Jesus deals with the root of the problem. The sinner itself. Obviously, we understand this. We get all our doctrines mixed up. But we understand this. We inherited the sinful nature, we said, because it was Adam's sin. So to rephrase that, so I became a sinner because of Adam. Because of Adam's sin, I became a sinner. Obviously, all of us agree with that. So because I'm a sinner, therefore I sin. So how do you reverse this problem? Now, because of Christ, the righteous one, I become righteous. So because I'm righteous, therefore I do what is right. If we think, because I sin, therefore I become a sinner, then we also believe, because I do what is right, therefore I am righteous. This is where religion kicks in. It's all about performance and perfecting ourselves. It's all about works, which is not biblical. Are you catching this? Yeah, yeah okay, this, they, they got it. How about you? Did you get this? <laughs> yeah, okay, you got it. Do you get it? I'm not a sinner because I sin. Because I'm a sinner, therefore I sin. So I am not righteous because I read, read all the Bible, because I prayed, I've attended the church for the last 55 years, because I've given money to the church, because I've brought 10 people to church. Because I, I did not commit adultery, because I did not steal, because I did not lie. No, no, none of that. It wasn't because I did what is right, therefore I am righteous. No, none of that. You know that. That is so scriptural, this statement. On the contrary, I am righteous because of Jesus. And that is the gospel. Jesus took my sinfulness and in exchange, by faith I receive His righteousness and therefore I am righteous and whatever that I do, whatever that I do, I think and all my, the things that I, that, that, that I live out my life is right. And that is the good news. So we are to preach the good news as Jesus preached the good news. The second thing I want to leave with us tonight is that not only we are to preach the good news, we are to personalize the good news. To personalize the good news. We are not to do witnessing, but we are to be a witness. It is a lifestyle. It is 24-7. It is not in what we do. It is who we are. I am a witness. Be a witness. The book of Acts tells us in, in Acts chapter 1. You see, in preaching the good news, we bring people to heaven. We point people to heaven. But in personalizing the good news, we bring heaven to people. You just missed the chance to give Jesus a big hand. 
When we personalize the good news, we are bringing heaven to people. We are bringing the church to Kajang. But in preaching the good news, we're bringing people to the church. <laughs> but when we personalize the good news, it is from the church to the people, to the city. We are to personalize the good news as well as to preach the good news. Our goal is to make earth more like heaven and people more like Jesus. Pastor Ed, where do you get that from? It is from the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who are in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like in heaven. And then the rest of the prayer is to make people more like Jesus. You see, one day when I was reading this prayer, I was, you know, I was preaching, I was preaching a, a, a message series on prayer. And I told the church, I said, don't worry, I will not preach the Lord's Prayer. I've been with the church for 22 years, same church. They have heard the Lord's Prayer too many times from the same speaker. Okay. <laughs> So I, you know, I've always tried to impress my congregation that as if I still got good materials. I said, don't worry, I'm not going to go to the Lord's Prayer. I remember I was in Kolkata that week. I was preaching a conference there and I was preparing the sermon for Sunday in, in Hong Kong. And the Holy Spirit told me, the Lord's Prayer. I said, no, maybe next time, not this time. The Holy Spirit said, do you, do you, are you saying you know the Lord's Prayer? I said, I think I know. The Holy Spirit says, so what does it mean, your kingdom come? I can write a book on the kingdom come. If you give me a few months, I think I can do it. But that time, I know the Holy Spirit is asking for a heart answer, not a head answer. I say, I don't really know. And the Holy Spirit said, look at the next verse. Give us today our daily bread. Are you saying your kingdom come today? Yes. Incomplete, but not imperfect. I want to put this one in, just in case some of you think I'm teaching a kingdom theology here, or dominion theology. Incomplete, but not imperfect. Figure that out, write it down. I suddenly realize I am to personalize the gospel no wonder the Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. Jesus, the Word was God. In verse 14, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know your Bible? Right? And dwelt among us. Wow. The Word became flesh. Interesting. So that we, the flesh, can become the Word. Pastor, I don't understand. What does it got to do with the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come. I've thought that we have always wanted to go to heaven. And still we want. Of course, I do. But... I realize that heaven is wanting to come to earth. I thought that earth is longing for heaven. That day I realized heaven is longing for earth. Heaven is longing for earth. That salvation is heaven in me today, so that today and me in heaven tomorrow. Salvation is heaven in me today and me in heaven tomorrow. You see, religion says, all religion, all religions in the world says, me in heaven tomorrow, never mind about today. Never mind about today. You are safe from sin, but they don't tell you what you're safe for. <laughs> That is religion right there. 
But from the very beginning, since creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, heaven and earth is one kingdom. Heaven and earth is like a double-story double house. Where earth represents the physical realm and heaven the spiritual realm. Earth is the visible realm and heaven is the invisible realm. And heaven is where God dwells. He lives there. But earth is where men dwell. And man is, is, is made, is created from heaven and earth. He took, he took the, the dust from the earth and he breathed. He breathed his breath, his spirit, Ro'ah, into that, that dust. And here came Adam. And Adam is meant to reflect the image of God, a mirror of God. Not God, but a mirror of God, a representation, a reflection of God on earth. And just as earth is a reflection of heaven. Of course, you have never heard that. Earth is a mirror of heaven. So when God began to name the stars and the moon, Adam began to name the animals and the trees. So Adam was always looking up and see what the Father is doing. And no wonder when Jesus came, Jesus said the same, I do what I see my Father does. And then He told us the same. He said, pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who are in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. So therefore, we bring heaven on earth. We don't run away from earth. We bring heaven on earth. And that is what the mission is all about. And that happens not in our preaching, but it is in our living. We begin to live our heavenly lifestyle in our marriage, in our home, in our church, in our community. And the new creation has started beginning with us. Not in the place, but in the person. Because the kingdom of God is invisible in us, but visible through us. It is manifested through us. And then the day will come, the Bible tells us when Jesus returns, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It will be renewed. But now, the recreation begins with the new Adam and the new Eve. But the first creation began with the heaven and earth. And then Adam and Eve is in his, in his reverse order. So God wants you and I, we are saved from sin and for Him, the Saviour. So we are not only called to preach the gospel, we are called to live out the gospel. God still loved the world. He loved the world 2,000 years ago and He sent His only Son. And today, He looked at you and I, He said, you are my sons and daughters. Now, I still love the world. I still love Kajang. I send you now just as I sent my Son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. Touch your neighbor and say, God just sent you now. Every day, everywhere, to every person, you are to bring heaven. You are to describe heaven to them. Oh, in heaven there is no sickness. In Jesus' name, be healed. In heaven there is love, there is peace. And therefore, in my marriage, there is love and peace. This is what it is like when you receive Jesus as king in your life. You too can experience heaven on earth. You don't have to wait to go to heaven. What is the guarantee if I don't experience heaven today and you ask me to wait? What is the guarantee? Maybe there is no heaven. Because I see hell on earth. But when Jesus rules and reigns in our hearts, there is a heavenly lifestyle. This is what heaven is like. And therefore, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace. Did you notice in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not what, uh, food and drinks. Righteousness, peace, and joy. And in Matthew chapter 6, what did Jesus say? Do not worry about what you eat or what you drink. And then in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. No wonder Romans 14, 17, so it's not about what you eat or what you drink. No wonder when it, when it comes Christmas, we say, peace on earth, righteousness, peace and joy. 
No wonder we sang, joy to the world because it is here. So, the Word became flesh so that we, the flesh, can become the Word. What does this mean, really? God wants us to be the Word of God. That when people look at you and I, they see the walking Bible, the talking Bible, the laughing Bible. They look at us, you know, that's a bigger Bible, Pastor. <laughs> they all of us look like the Bible. All of us look like the Bible. And therefore you say, I look like Jesus. There will be people who will never read the Bible, cannot read the Bible, don't have the Bible. Don't, don't tell them, I give you a Bible, go home and read. No, don't do that too quickly. Tell them, look at me and you're reading the Bible. Okay? Okay. <laughs> he, he give a nod, it's okay then. <laughs> look at me and you will read the Bible. You are already reading the Bible every day. You know, in some parts of the world, in fact, most parts of the world today, persecution comes, right? They are being observed by the authority. They are being followed. I think you know what I'm talking about, okay? And that should be the happiest thing because you're being watched. You get the chance to be the talking Bible. <laughs> they get to observe your life. You know, Christians who don't live out the Bible, they get very worried. Oh, people watching me. You should be very happy. They're looking at you. Personalizing the Bible. This is what we are to do. This is what God has for you. To bring heaven on earth. How is your life today, my brothers and sisters? Why is that it matters when I said you are, you know, oh, this phrase. You know, my English is not that good. My Indonesian is so much better. But this phrase kind of bothered me for a long time. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am a sinner saved by grace. Do you know this statement is wrong? Never, ever, ever, ever said this statement. I am a sinner saved by grace. So, what is your sin? Tell me now. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am not a sinner. This is not who I am. I was a sinner saved by grace. Every time when you say, I am a sinner saved by grace as a child of God in Christ, it breaks the heart of the Father. Because a sinner is separated from the Father, has no relationship with the Father. A sinner does not have the DNA of the Father. A sinner says, my DNA is with the Satan, the father of lies. And so many Christians continue to say, I am a sinner saved by grace. It breaks the heart of God. I was a sinner saved by grace. I am a saint saved by grace. Another statement, then we will close. This one is controversial. Take it or leave it, okay? <laughs> I'm a servant of God. I'm a servant of God. You know, I have a son. He's 19 years old. He's my height. Exactly. We, you know, we look quite the same. 
for you youngers out there. <laughs> I give you his telephone number. Okay. <laughs> now, come back to the point. What do you think? If my son would come up here on stage, he say, I am Caleb Teo. I'm Pastor Ed's servant. What happened? What happened? What did I do wrong? I can always look for servants. I can, only, I can always pay for servants. But that day when we had decided to have children, my wife gave birth to a son. I wanted a son. I wanted a son that serves. If he doesn't serve a son that sleeps, never mind. But he's my son. A son that carries my image. A son that reflects me. I wanted a son. You know, when God sent his son in exchange for all of us to be his sons and daughters, and Jesus became the sinner, he who knew no sin became sin for us. What other words can you use to? Try other translation. you see clearly what that verse meant. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And here every day I still call myself a servant. It breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God. I call you to be my son and daughter. This is who you are. But you kept calling yourself sinner. You kept calling yourself, beating yourself up to say you are a servant but you are my son and my daughter. I want to have a relationship with you because a servant does not have a relationship with the master. A servant strives, seek for attention. A servant has to perform and try to perfect himself. But a son is secure. A son is always there in the house. A son is worthy already. And that's the story of the prodigal son. Completely, this is what it is. He came back. He didn't need to prove himself. He just needed to turn back and come to the Father. This is what the Father has for all of us. And now he said, you must understand what this gospel is. So that when you go out there, you're not only preaching the gospel, you're personalizing the gospel. They're looking at you. You are the gospel. You are the Word. You are the Bible. And, and, you know, people, you know, religious people, they find, it, they, they find pride to say, we are a Bible-believing church. Any church that has to stand up and say, we're a Bible-believing church, you better be nervous. I didn't say don't go attend, but I said you better get nervous. Because we all should be the living Bible church. It is not enough to just be a Bible-believing church. God wants us to be a living Bible church. Religion says just believe. Jesus say, just live. Be a living Bible church. He wants us to lift out the life of Christ in us. It's the purity of our lives, not the purity of our doctrines. Paul did not say, I am not ashamed of the law, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Did he say that? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel has a power to change your lives.
Amen. Praise God. You want heaven on earth in your life? You want heaven to come and this place to reflect heaven? You want your home to reflect heaven? Your marriage? You want Kajang to reflect heaven? Some call it revival. Whatever word that you call it, never mind. We're not into, you know, playing with words. But the presence of God to come. We're seeking for the presence of God. Not prestige, but the presence. For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. He sent a person, a son. He did not send a servant. He did not send a piece of paper, but He sent a person. So that we can have a relationship with Him. How is your relationship with God tonight? Do you have an intimate relationship with Him? What is worship? Worship is enjoying the presence of God. Worship is not about singing. You know what is marriage? Marriage is enjoying my wife's presence. <laughs> Single, huh? Marriage is enjoying my wife's presence. What is family? Family is enjoying each other's presence. It's not about eating. It's not about going holiday. But if we go holiday and we enjoy each other's presence, then yes. Worship is not singing. Worship is not Bible reading. Praying is not five minutes a day, reciting the Lord's Prayer 50 times. It's not about fast, fasting 40 days. But if you enjoy fasting 40 days, you enjoy Jesus, then that is worship. That is prayer. It is not tithing. It is not giving. Give with a cheerful heart. When you enjoy the Lord, <laughs> that is worship. That is relationship. And the moment we enter into a relationship, we are set free. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We're set free. Man's greatest need in life is freedom. I'm talking about men. Men. <laughs> freedom. <laughs> That's the freedom you're looking for. Let me close with this. Room, uh, Matthew 6.33, let's come back to this verse. Seek first. The word seeking here is not striving, looking for something. The word seeking here is different from the other seek. You see, for such the Gentiles seek after, then that is striving. It's a different Greek word. And the, the next time when he used the word seek in verse 33, he said desiring. Desire. It's not striving to get it, but it's desiring. A sense of hunger and thirst for it from within you. It says, seek first. You see, the word first, all Malaysians should know here. Because the word first here is proton. <laughs> Not produa. Pro, produa? Pro? No, there's another one. Pro. Not produa. Proton. Okay. It is proton. And in the Greek word proton, it is not chronological one, number one, but it is the only one. Seek first. Seek only that one. This is what he meant. And so many times we think, God number one, family number two, church number three. I told my staff, when you come interview, for interview and you say, God number one, church number two, we fire you. <laughs> then you go and work for God. <laughs> But God is the only one. And in my marriage, God is the only one. And I treat my wife, my children the way God would want me to do it. The only one. Not another one. Not the number one. But the only one. When I first met my wife, she was another one. <laughs> then during a course, the course of our a courtship for four years, she became... My number one. But that day, 26 years ago, when we exchanged our vows and we got married, 
Ever since then, she became my only one. If Jesus is just another one, you are still in Egypt, in the world. Egypt is a metaphor for the world. But if Jesus is only your number one, then you're in the wilderness. You experience Him, but you have not yet encountered Him. You're still in the wilderness. It's a place of barrenness. It's a place of isolation. It's a place of running away, escaping from Egypt. But then, when you enter the promised land, that is a heavenly lifestyle, heaven on earth, then Jesus is the only one. Then you are engaging with the world. You're killing giants. You're experiencing fruitfulness and abundance in the promised land. Where are you tonight? Is Jesus just another one, the number one, or the only one in your walk with Him? Are you in Egypt? Are you in the wilderness? Or today you are in the promised land? Experiencing abundance, victorious lifestyle, heaven on earth. The the lifestyle that God will have intended it for you. And you can enjoy it right now here on earth. Would you close your eyes in a word of prayer? You know, my friends, tonight the presence of God is here and He loves you. He comes as a father. He comes as a father and He's calling you. He doesn't come as a master. He doesn't come as a judge. He comes as a father. He said, tonight, my child, I want you to know that you are my child, my sons and daughter. I'm not asking you to do more. I'm not asking you to do less. I'm asking you to be you because I love you as you are. Because when you fall in love with me, when you respond to my invitation, this is where you become more like me. My child today, just as in the book of Genesis, I created Adam in my image. God created man in his own image. Today, I want to recreate you in my image. And yet so many times, religion, the religious spirit, wants to make God in man's image. Religion wants to make church look like man. But God wants to make the church, you and I, to look like Him. I want you to look like me. When you talk about a heaven on earth lifestyle, it's to look like your father. I do not know where you are tonight. Some of us must respond wherever you are. Just slip up your hand and put it down. You say, Lord, I want to experience heaven on earth in my marriage, in my home, my workplace. I'm pretty fed up with wilderness life. In a wilderness, I experience miracle, manna, yes, but I don't encounter God. Today, manna is not good enough. Provision is not good enough. The miracles is not good enough. I want to experience God. I want to kill giants, not run away from Egypt, not a place of isolation. Who else? Can I just see your hand? I want a promised land type of life. Anyone else? Thank you for that hand. Thank you. And those of us who raise our hands, you know, would you just follow me in this prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you that the promised land lifestyle is here for me. Today, Jesus came so that I can come to the Heavenly Father. Jesus became me so that I can become like Him. Jesus overcame my sin and death so that I can overcome sin and death today I am an overcomer I am not only forgiven of my sin I'm given power over my sin and I know Jesus will come again today I am a son and a daughter of God I'm no longer a sinner today I am a child of God. I'm not a servant anymore. Thank you, Jesus. 
I love my relationship with my Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give a lot a big hand. Thank you.